The last line of the gospel from last week was that we cannot serve both God and mammon. We can't be um, sort of occupied by both God and money. I was thinking about this as I read this gospel this weekend, talking about this rich man and the poor man, and I thought about how infatuated we are with money. Right, there are so many songs about money. I am a, a music guy, so I thought of all the songs about money that I know. The one in particular that I thought of throughout the week is the Beatles, Baby, You're a Rich Man because of the rich man. Right, but there's all kinds of them. Money by Pink Floyd and Easy Money by Billy Joel and I Want to Be Rich by Callaway. And, right, there's songs and songs and songs about money. Right? And we pursue it because we think it's going to make us happy. Maybe the best song for this weekend uh, in honor of Lazarus is Eric Clapton's uh, Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. Right? He's sitting there in his misery and nobody is tending to him except for the dogs right, who come to lick his sores. And so why is money bad? Or is money bad? Right, let's look at that during this homily. Uh, the first thing we need to do, though, is uh, in this theme of going back to last lines from last week, we'll go back right before the second reading, where it picks up this weekend. The line from verse 10 in that uh, first letter of St. Timothy is, For the love of money is the root of all evils, and some people in their desire for it have strayed from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. Right, so we see that it's not money in and of itself that's bad. Right, it's the love of money that corrupts. Right, and why is the love of money a bad thing? Well, St. Paul is telling Timothy it's bad because some people in their desire for it have strayed from the faith. Right, we see this. People in their greed and their love for money will do some pretty immoral things to try to get it. Right? So that love of money above all else is what is bad, is what they are speaking of. Right? That's what gets us into trouble. So we see that money is bad, but why is it bad? Well, we have this great story in the Gospel of Lazarus and the rich man. Right? The rich man was consumed by his wealth. We hear that he wore these purple garments and fine linen, and purple was a very, very expensive uh, color. They would make the purple dye from these snails, and it took an incredible amount of snails and an incredible amount of work to make the dye. And so only extremely wealthy people and royalty wore purple. So this rich man, because he was consumed by his wealth, right, wore these purple garments to show everyone else that he was wealthy, right, to boast of his wealth. And then it also says that he dined sumptuously each day. He didn't treat himself on the weekends to a nice meal, but he dined sumptuously each and every day. Right? He consumed himself with this food, a very extravagant food. And meanwhile, he has Lazarus, right? This poor man who is in great need, not just far off, right? He doesn't just pass him as he's walking down the street, but he's lying at his door. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had a poor person with sores all over their body and a dog licking them, lying at my door, I would probably notice them. Right? Lazarus probably, or uh, not Lazarus, the rich man probably had to step over Lazarus as he went in and out of his probably fancy house. Right? As he brushed the sumptuous meal off of his purple garments. And so Lazarus was right there. But he couldn't care about him because the rich man's wealth had made him self sufficient. It had made him self-reliant, and most of all, it had made him self-centered and self-absorbed. 
Right? He was so focused on his own life, his own money and pursuit of money, that he failed to notice the person standing right there in front of him, right? in great need. And so what, what do we know about the rich man? Not a whole lot, right? But I was thinking about, was he always this way? Was he born greedy? Was he born consumed with money? The gospel doesn't tell us, but I would have to imagine that he wasn't. That he became this way. Right? And what is it that led him to this? How did he end up this way? I think it's that when he started to get money, right, the money made him comfortable. Again, he was able to become sort of self-reliant and self-absorbed, right? His money gave him this level of comfort that made him soft, right? It made him weak. And this kind of goes back to, I think it was last week's gospel, right? We heard about the dishonest steward who, uh, whenever he was being removed, he said, well, I'm too weak to dig. He was too weak to dig because he had been so consumed with money that he didn't have to work. He would get other people to do his stuff for him. And so he became weak. And so the lesson, I think, in the gospel is that certainly uh, the love of money can corrupt us. But I think that there's even a deeper lesson for us. That comfort, right, the comfort of having everything we need right there ready for us, it makes us soft. Right? It makes us weak. And this is true in our worldly life, right, with money, but it's also true in our spiritual life. Right? We see this, that in the early years of the church, whenever there was incredible persecution, what happened to the number of faithful? It skyrocketed. Whenever the church was under attack, whenever it was difficult to live the faith, the number of the faithful increased. And we see that whenever it's very easy, kind of like it is in our time, to live the faith, we make it easy because we don't really follow it, what happens to the number of faithful? It goes down. Right? We grow weak and we stop practicing the faith. And this is not a new thing. Right? This is exactly what the prophet Amos is talking about in the first reading. So he's saying to the people of Israel, right, woe to, compla- to the complacent in Zion. Right? Woe to those who are comfortable with where they are. And he goes on, he says, lying upon their beds of ivory, right, living this very comfortable and extravagant life, they have become weak and they've become disinterested in spiritual things. Right, this is why at the end of the reading he says uh, that they're not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Amos is writing at the time right before Israel is cast out of the promised land. Right? The Babylonians come in, they conquer them, and they, they kick them out. And the people could care less. They're so caught up in their sumptuous living that they don't care that they are removed from this land that God has promised them. And in a way, that symbolizes the fact that they are removed from their relationship with God. Right? They've become absorbed with this love of comfort that comes from their easy living. That love of money, the love of comfort, makes us lazy in our spiritual life. And it fosters this lack of concern for our soul. If I'm so consumed with living a comfortable life in the world, then I lose interest in my soul. Because if I care for my soul, then that's going to bring me some discomfort. And I don't like that. Notice that the rich man didn't really do anything wrong. It doesn't say that he murdered Lazarus. It doesn't say that he cheated him out of anything. Right? But the problem is what he didn't do. He had this opportunity to love someone in his midst, to care for someone who needed it, and he failed to do it. And so what do we do with all of this? Right? How do we uh, apply this to our own life? Well, I think we need to spend time praying... Right? Asking how we're doing in the spiritual life. 
Do I live a very comfortable spiritual life? Do I refuse to be challenged by the teachings of the church, right, by those areas in my life that I need to improve in? Uh, How am I too comfortable in my faith? Do I commit sins of omission, right, not doing the good that I know I ought to do? Do I refuse to spend time in prayer? Do I refuse to go to confession? Do I refuse to be generous to the poor? Do I refuse to teach my children about the faith? All of these things are not acts that we do, but it's ways that we sin by refusing to do what we are supposed to do. And so we pray today for the grace uh, to make ourselves uncomfortable in our faith, right? Through our uh, living out the hard teachings, through our doing penance, Right, through our denying ourselves certain comforts. And we do it uh, because we want to follow St. Paul's encouragement to Timothy in that second reading. Right, he tells Timothy that you are to pursue righteousness. Right, you are to compete well for the faith. And we do it because we want to lay hold of eternal life.